Dr. Sylvia Earle, welcome to the Client Pod. Nice to be on board. It's such an honor to have you on this show. You know, just going through your, your career, it is so inspiring. It's so incredible. I'm curious, what was it that first inspired you to want to learn more about the oceans and marine life as well? Oh, I think it started when I first met the ocean. I was about three years old. My family had gone to the Jersey Shore for a short vacation. And, you know, first I could, I could hear the ocean, that the sound of the waves. Maybe even before then I could smell the difference. There's a certain saltiness that it's probably life in the ocean that gives it the smell. But anyway, finally coming over the dunes, I could see the ocean and at last I could touch the ocean. But it's what I saw along the shore and later in the ocean itself, it's not just rocks and water, it's alive. And those horseshoe crabs along the beach in the summer on the Jersey shore, I thought were just the greatest creatures I'd ever met. <laughs> I love all kinds of creatures, but those horseshoe crabs, they just were like nothing I'd ever seen before. And I especially liked the fact that I knew they wouldn't hurt anybody, but they're grownups who came walking down the beach and they warned me, get away from them. They're, they, they're gonna poke you with this long pointy tail, the tails. And I said, I, I felt so smug, at the grand old age of three, because I knew they wouldn't hurt us. We were probably doing more harm to them than they were to us. And it continues that way. We're, we're really, not being very kind to horseshoe crabs. Well, you've shown in your career an incredible appreciation for marine life. And this goes, you know, goes back to your study of algae. You got a doctorate of phycology. What did you find so fascinating about algae that you decided it was worth studying as a career? Well, first of all, they're beautiful. One of my professors first at Florida State during a summer class in marine biology, and then later at Duke University, Harold Hum saw the beauty, the, looking under a microscope, but just looking at them in the water. They are so intriguing and finding something about their history that their existence long preceded plants, trees on the land, and they're still there. And the, the fact that they generate oxygen, absorb carbon dioxide, and the very smallest ones, blue-greens, we now call them blue-green bacteria, because now we know what we didn't know about their true nature, actually generate most of the oxygen in the atmosphere and absorb much of the carbon dioxide as well. They're so important to climate. And I, when I first became intrigued with phytoplankton, <laughs> as its general name is for the little guys that live in the water column and do the heavy lifting in terms of capturing carbon, generating food for life in the sea, but in the, as a byproduct generate oxygen and have been doing so for hundreds of millions of years, long before there were photosynthesizers on the land. This action was transforming Earth's atmosphere into something that is, makes it possible for large creatures such as humans to survive and thrive. <laughs> well, Brock and I are both certified scuba divers, and we both hey. agree that being <laughs> lucky enough, yes, we, we absolutely love doing it on those off chances that we are able to actually do it. But we, you know, we've been lucky enough to have experienced ocean life up close as divers. And, and that has increased our appreciation for the ocean. And it really has motivated us to do more, to, to protect it. And you've done a lot more diving than we, we will ever do. So I don't know. Which, I've, been, I've been around a little longer, but don't <laughs> discount that what you can get done in your lifetime. <laughs> Come on. And I, 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 hope, I would hope to log maybe a, a tenth of the number of hours that you have underwater. But how would you describe the feeling you get when you are scuba diving? 
Well, there's the physical pleasure of being weightless. Even with a tank and all the equipment that you use as a scuba diver in the ocean, you actually have to use weights to be able to get neutral in the water. And it is just such a glorious sensation of freedom, of being able to lift off and literally fly. You choose a place that you can see some distance away and you don't walk there, you fly there. It's just, a, it's the stuff of dreams. My mother waited until she was 81 to take the plunge. And then she said, why didn't you get me in the ocean sooner? And I thought I tried, but I should have tried harder. And I try with everyone. Don't let life slip by without, without putting on a mask, at least a face mask, so you can see more clearly. There's a lot of other equipment that helps the experience. I particularly like little submarines that enable anybody to go deeper and stay longer than you can using scuba or this wonderful new diving approach of using rebreathers, the same kind of equipment that astronauts use when they are doing extra vehicular <laughs> activity, walking on the moon or flying outside of their spacecraft. So oh, what can I say? It gives you, it's a passport to the greatest part of the planet where life occurs. Literally 97% of living space on earth is ocean space. And most of it is dark below where light penetrates. Of course, it, at night it's dark all the time, but even in daylight, even in the midday, in the clearest ocean water, now, like in Hawaii or the, out in the Sargasso Sea, if you go down to about 100 meters, it's like twilight. And the deeper you go, the darker it gets. And at a thousand meters, even less than a thousand meters, it's dark, except for bioluminescence, the living light that that shows the way for fish, jellyfish, just a whole array of life that like fireflies, like glowworms, make it possible using chemical light to illuminate the world around them. And it's just glorious. I listened, or rather I read William Beebe's book called Half Mile Down when I was <laughs> a teenager. And it just captured my imagination. He described going down literally a half a mile, about a thousand meters down, and found himself surrounded by what he described as suns, moons, and stars, a galaxy of light. I wanted to see it too. It was a long time before I actually got to go a half mile down in a little submersible, but anybody who lives close to the shore or can get to the, a, an ocean at night sometimes can see a similar kind of light show. Almost always you can see some creatures that make little sparkles and flashes well, almost anywhere in any ocean at night. But there are occasions when blooms of certain kinds of, of microorganisms dinoflagellates, just make waves break with just this, this whole huh, flash, splash of light. It's, it's just one of the wonders of the world. And in the deep sea, it's common. On the order of 90% of life in the deep sea has some form of bioluminescence. So technically it's dark, when you get below where sunlight shines, but actually, <laughs> thanks to living light, there are creatures with adaptations to sense that light and they use it sometimes to find food, to find mates, to signal one another, 
to stay together as a group, although they have chemo reception and the sensing of sound and motion on a scale that, that we don't have. It's the superpower, the whole range of superpowers that life in the sea possess. Uh, many people look at tuna and they think, mmm, delicious. And that's the only way they see tuna in a casserole or sushi or in a salad. But I see tuna as creatures that make me and engineers and biologists sigh with envy because they can see and they can sense what we can only dream about. It seems so pathetic that the smartest thing we generally think that we can do with the fish, tunas and others, is simply to eat them when they have miracles to share if we're smart enough, wise enough to look at them with real respect. I have to imagine, you know, going down to that depth and seeing like darkness in the middle mm. of the day is, is, is so awe-inspiring. And I'm also, I, I, I've heard you in, in, in other talks discuss your love for night diving, right? Because oh, it really yeah. is, uh, you are seeing a different, uh, the ocean's different at night. I'm curious what has been what has inspired your particular love for night dives? Recognition that most of life on Earth lives in the dark all of the time, except for bioluminescence. Literally, the average depth of the ocean is four kilometers, 4.2 kilometers. It's, you know, two and a half miles. It's about the depth where the Titanic rests. That's just the average depth. The maximum is 11 kilometers about seven miles down and that vast space the deeper you go the darker it gets well until sunlight disappears and illumination by by luminescence begins and it's cold pressure increases the deeper you go the deeper you go the less we know about the living world about our own planet and yet when you think about where's the carbon where are carbon-based units? Where is life? It's in the ocean. And it's been there as a part of what shapes planetary processes for most of the history of, of the Earth. I mean, four and a half billion years is about the age of the Earth, geologists have concluded. And for much of that time, oxygen was scarce in the atmosphere. Photosynthesis did not exist for the first billion years or so, more than that. And, you know, we, we dream of going to other planets to set up housekeeping, to escape from the problems we've created here on Earth. But the biggest problem we would face going elsewhere is, is what we have here, even now, even though Earth has been greatly degraded owing to our activities. But... We've got all the ingredients that are lacking elsewhere that are related to four and a half billion years of a living planet. Starting from scratch, we might, we might, you know, terraform Mars, as some people dream of doing, plant photosynthesizers that gradually could transform the atmosphere of Mars that is mostly carbon dioxide, what there is of the atmosphere on Mars, would take a long time to get to where we are. We're newcomers and we arrived on a planet that is favorable to us, but we could go back even a hundred million years and earth would not be suitable for us. That's only a hundred million years. We'd have a hard time on a planet that it is got a built-in life support system. So we, our job right now really should be the headline of every day. What can we do to restore health to Earth's life support system, the natural living systems that make this place habitable, not just hospitable, habitable, where we got the temperature range. You know, sometimes it's a little too cold, a little too warm, but imagine having a planet that is forever, everywhere, too hot for us, not too hot for some forms of life. Life in some fashion would continue, but we are heading for 
the planet that is truly hostile for us. And that's what keeps me awake. It's what keeps me intrigued, keeps me excited because we have time, not a lot, but we have time to reverse the trend that we have created, that I have witnessed in a lifetime of observing the changes when coral reefs were mostly intact when I started diving in the 1950s. And now essentially half of them are gone or are in a state of sharp decline. And it's not just coral reefs, it's kelp forests, seagrass meadows, coastal mangroves, coastal marshes, and transformation of life in the ocean, 90% of the sharks, of many of the big fish that we like to eat. Or we, we've eaten so many and destroyed the habitats through systems like trawling destroys entire ecosystems. It's like burning the forests or, or clear cutting, but worse than clear cutting, you dig up the forests and really make it uh, transform their nature. That's what happens when you drag these heavy trawls across the sea floor. You not only take life that's there, the carbon-based units release the carbon into the atmosphere, compounding the problem like clear-cutting forests, but you destroy the carbon capturing systems in the process. So as a, an oceanographer, a marine biologist, I look at climate and I say, something's missing from your balance sheet. Oh, you sky watching climate scientists, <laughs> you forgot about the system that, that basically drives climate, distributes heat, um, basically maintains the stability of, of temperature within a range that's suitable for us through ocean currents that, that conduct heat around and absorb heat and just mellow out the planet in a point way that is, that is hospitable for us. If, if just imagine Earth without an ocean. It, it's hard to imagine because it's such a part it's just the dominant feature of the earth. But if you should strip it away, you'd have rocks and water that's embedded in rocks and whatever remaining fresh water there might be, but that would soon disappear without the ocean because the ocean keeps replenishing fresh water through evaporation into the atmosphere that falls back from clouds onto land and sea. So take away the ocean, you take away the water cycle. You, you just have a planet that's barren, much like our fellow planets in the solar system in that they have rocks and water and some kind of a, an atmosphere, gas material, but they don't have what, what makes Earth habitable, life. Not just life across the board, but the existence of life transforming rocks and water over a very long period of time, driving the chemistry of the planet, driving the temperature of the planet in a way that works, the way that works for us. And in, in four and a half decades, I mean, it, it isn't deliberate, but it almost seems like we're determined to undermine our own future, our own the, the planet's capacity to support us. How do we do that? By poisoning the water, poisoning the atmosphere, by, by destroying the fabric of life, by consuming ocean wildlife on a scale that by any measure cannot be sustained. Uh, taking the populations of fish that were more or less certainly more intact when I was a child than they are today. But the process of, of extraction of ocean wildlife and wildlife from the land has been going on from the beginning of human existence. But it has scaled up remarkably with the technology that now makes it possible to find, capture, 
market and consume, whether it's fish from the sea or trees from the land, birds, we've destroyed their habitats. That's one way of consuming them. We take away their life support system, if you will. But, you know, the, the good news through all of this doom and gloom is we know, we can see it, we can measure it, we can project it, we can dive into the past, see how it was. I can dive into decades <laughs> and as a witness be able to say, not just from reading books, although the evidence has accumulated, it's there for anyone to see and read and digest, but I've witnessed it personally. And again, more good news because we have awakened to our power to destroy. We have stopped short of killing the last great whales. In 1986, through international agreement, we hit the pause button, put a moratorium on the commercial killing of the great whales. A few nations, Norway, Iceland, and Japan, have persisted, continued finding ways to justify killing whales, even though the rest of the world has, and many people in Norway, Iceland, in Japan, share the respect for living whales, but the policies of their governments has favored the continued extraction of them as commodities. So, <laughs> because most of the world has stopped, what's happened? There are more whales today than when I was a kid. <laughs> it's, that's exciting. We can have a positive impact through changes in our behavior. More humpback whales, more blue whales, more of almost all of the great whales. The one exception, because the levels have gotten so low, the northern right whales. The population goes up and down more or less three to 400 individuals and although there are protective measures, other, we don't deliberately kill them, but we hit, we strike them with increased shipping, ship traffic, and we've, we, we kill them with cap, capturing them in fishing nets, entanglement, crab pots, lobster pots, entanglement, and it, it kills thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of marine mammals, dolphins, whales, seals, sea lions, uh, otters are killed by entanglement with mostly fishing gear that is lost or discarded. It is, it's not criminal, but it's, in a way you think, given the level of destruction that these discarded and, and lost um, fishing nets that are made of materials that didn't exist when I was a child, but now plastic synthetic materials, those that were deployed mostly since the 1960s are, are still there. And they continue to kill, even though the fishermen aren't pulling the nets in, they're out there in the ocean killing life. And the, the good news again is now we know, we can see it, we can measure it. You as divers must have seen discarded fishing lines, uh, icy gear, almost every dive that I take. It not just in within diver depth, but in the in the deep ocean as well. It's one of the great concerns about using little submarines. You might just get snared by a uh, by a drift net or by some of those long lines that are really long. I mean, they can maybe kilometers, ten, tens of kilometers long with baited hooks every few feet. And now we know, again, that's the good news. There are more turtles today, despite the fact that thousands of them still get entangled in nets. We have done a better job of protecting turtle nests, of giving turtles a break. It's not considered cool to have turtle steak <laughs> or turtle soup anymore, but as a result, the people will actually pay big bucks to go to Mexico and Costa Rica to watch little turtles hatch or to be able to go dive with turtles, 
to dive with whales, or at least watch whales from the surface. The value of whale watching, of turtle watching, far exceeds their value as dead animals. Same is true with sharks. A live shark is a lot more important, more valuable for tourism dollars. And then if you add on something that you might have heard about, about blue carbon, that is life in the sea, as it relates to climate, and a study that was released at the World Economic Forum in 2020, where the, the International Monetary Fund commissioned a study of the value of whales, of whales for their carbon capture and sequestration value. And what is it worth to have living whales, not dead whales for meat and oil with a relatively small dollar sign, but whales as a cycle of life, the carbon cycle, whales feeding on krill and small fish and transforming their carbon into whale carbon and then putting nutrients back into the system, big fertilizer units that power the phytoplankton that continues to capture carbon and generate oxygen and shape the chemistry of the planet in ways favorable to us. So every year, an assessment, if you took the current standing number of, of carbon that whales have, the International Monetary Fund assigns a, a trillion dollar value to it. So if that's true for whales, what about sharks? What about the standing number of carbon-based units we call sharks? If it works for sharks that sequester carbon, when we take them out, we release the carbon to the atmosphere. That's a, a carbon positive. It's like when you burn a forest, you release the carbon to the atmosphere. Instead of being a carbon sink, they're a carbon source. Same is true with the ocean. It's the great carbon capturing mechanism, the, the most effective that we have on the planet. It maintains Earth as a habitable, <laughs> climate-friendly planet. And here we are undermining the capacity of the carbon of the ocean to do its have that function by extracting millions of tons of sharks, of tuna, of swordfish, of shrimp, of you name it. We'll catch it and try to market it in some fashion. We are really good at, at killing and really good at only seeing a short-term value. Industrial fishing is something that is, is really a critical element of the carbon crisis we now face. And if we're serious, about, about addressing climate change. We have to get serious about stopping the industrial fishing on the high seas. It's subsidized for heaven's sakes. That right. makes, <laughs> so we, we have some pro problems that we can fix. We just have to will. And I feel like this, this is so relatable to the issue of just overall plastic pollution as well, right? The fact that we have so much plastic that we have put into the ocean because we are relying on that as a cheap material. I'm curious, what impact do you see that having on, on the ocean today? Plastic is overall the other oil spill, but it's people are less aware of it, less conscious of how oil the basic material for many, most plastic goods. Um, you know, we, we have the oil spill in the sky, with carbon dioxide released when you burn oil and gas and coal. <clears throat> but there's also the transformation, particularly of oil into these plastic goods that didn't exist when I was a child. They started to become useful and still are useful to human society. Um, starting in about the, the 1950s. So 
in my early years as a diver, as an explorer, as a scientist, there were no plastics in the ocean. Now it's hard to find any ocean without plastic. It's pervasive. Those nets, those lines, those traps, those goods that are made of synthetic materials that now lace the ocean everywhere when they're lost or discarded, don't degrade. They sometimes break up, but they, they do, in some cases, degrade, uh, but not, not to the point of, of going away. They just become smaller, become fragments. They become microplastics and even nanoplastics right down to the molecular level, so small that they're still intact as these synthetic materials, but are engulfed. They're, they're basically invisible, except with a microscope, super microscope, but they can pass through tissues. They're in water. They're in the air. You can inhale them, then they become a part of you. The fish integrate them into their system too. It's, it's not a problem that we can easily reverse, I think, plastics that are already in the ocean, if they're, I mean, the, the best hope is that there are some bacteria that have an appetite for plastic and break them down to a certain level, but they're, again, they maintain their integrity as plastics. So I, we've just created a big experiment, <laughs> treating earth as a, as something over which we have no control over the outcome. We're just witnesses to, well, let's see what's going to happen next <laughs> as a result of what we put into our life support system. We can do the best we can to not let more go into the ocean or into the atmosphere or into landfills. We can stop at the source, but we can also do what many people are inspired to do. Go retrieve what you can. It isn't just fishing gear, although that's a dominant factor. It's also things that we're more familiar with, like plastic cups, plastic um, bags, um, the plastics that we use in, in our everyday goods. One logical aid, since plastics probably are an integral part of our civilization going forward to make sure that they are recycled, that they're built to be recycled, that, that they're not built to be thrown away, that there's a, a recognition that there is a place for materials that we create, but that place is not swimming around in the ocean and not swimming around in our bodies as nanoplastics, we, we have to come to grips. And people are, I mean, it's really exciting to see industries thinking like the closed loop where we can't afford to waste materials. We repurpose them and sometimes reconfigure the plastics back to their base materials in, in the recycling technologies. It doesn't happen out in nature. Maybe over long periods of time, there are microbes that will figure out how to digest plastic and transform it back to basic materials like carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. But that's not happening anytime soon on a scale that will be meaningful to solving the problems. So all things considered, as big a problem as plastic pollution is to the ocean and therefore to us. The bigger problem is what we're taking out of the ocean, truly. The removal of ocean wildlife, the dismembering of these ecosystems, the breaking of the links, the, the nutrient cycles. When we extract, mindlessly extract, just for, for products, for fish oil, for cat food, dog food, for fish food, for, for animal food that we, to, to chickens and pigs and cows. <laughs> That's where a lot of the ocean wildlife that is extracted on an industrial scale goes to. They just grind up these little creatures 
They don't even care what species it is. They don't care what superpowers they have that might be of interest to us. They have no concern about the medicinal properties that we might discover when the ecosystems are clear cut by trawling. It's just, what can we turn this, this carbon-based material into as a source of something we can sell as fertilizer, as animal food, or as whatever it is that some concocted idea of what ground up fish can be used for. So it's such a waste. It's such a, an insult to human intelligence that we would allow this to continue with our eyes wide open, knowing that it's blue carbon. We need to keep that in the ocean. We need to sequester carbon. We're looking for carbon capture devices that we, you know, business deals. Let's find a carbon capture device that can take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Well, how about trees? How about phytoplankton? How about storing the carbon in living systems on the land and in the sea? is the first line of action that we can employ to keep ourselves safe from what we've already done to undermine the integrity of the planet. Well, we've talked about the, you know, the, the depletion of fish species. We've talked about the, you know, the plastic pollution problem. These are, these are visible impacts that humans have had on the ocean, which is, which is just massive. Another one of these visible impacts is the rising sea levels that have, are, that are a result of rising global temperatures. So how have you seen, or how are, how are rising sea levels impacting the rest of the planet? Insidiously, it, because it happens slowly, people are not as paying as much attention to this as in common sense would suggest that we might. <laughs> we are maybe getting more attention now as the combination of rising sea level coupled with storms of increasing frequency and intensity owing to the warming of the planet that the, that even a small increase in sea level has uh, compounds the impact of storms hurricane sandy got the attention of new yorkers for a while but there will be other hurricanes there will be other storms that won't be as possible to um, to deal with going forward. And low-lying countries such as the Maldives, Bangladesh, Pacific Islands, across the board, some of them rise up with high mountain peaks from the ocean, like Hawaii, for example, or Palau, or where I was just a week ago, the Azores, part of the mid-Atlantic ridge that runs down the backbone of the Atlantic Ocean, but pokes through the surface with a few high mountains that are islands. But there's still even, though there may be some high land in these island nations, the coastal area is nonetheless vulnerable. And that's where the destruction of mangroves, marshes, coral reefs really comes into sharp focus because these systems really give protection from storms, storm surge, uh, increased tidal action, um, whatever it is that, that our habit of walling off the ocean with sea walls and, and destroying the natural systems. I look at Florida, so many sea walls, instead of the natural resilience that mangroves and marshes uh, afford, um, it just makes us more vulnerable to these changing times. So there are things we can do if we just <laughs> use our common sense and anticipate the 
increasing sea level rise caused by the melting of polar ice and glaciers and the expansion of warming water. The seawater water expands somewhat slightly, but enough to make a difference on an ocean scale. So it adds to sea level rise. Similarly, it contracts, but it also becomes occupies less space when there's ice. <laughs> and we we're losing the ice and we're we're expanding the volume that water occupies with the warming. So wouldn't you think that we would do everything that we can as a priority every day to do what we can individually and collectively to take climate change seriously. One thing I think that's positive about 2020 and, and now into 2021 about COVID-19 there are lots of debate about huh, about the varying levels of response that people have, but across the board, people have responded one way or another when their lives are threatened. The bigger life-threatening force that we now face, far greater than viruses and other diseases, it's climate change. It's the ability to exist on a planet that is vulnerable to our actions. It's also, call it vulnerable if you will, it can be, it can be changed favorably through actions we can take. The real key is not just knowing taking that knowledge and then doing something about it. That's where we're at. We're right on the edge. We have the power to shift from decline to stability to recovery, finding an enduring place for ourselves within the natural systems that have always kept us alive and will continue to do so if we take care of them the way they have taken care of us, respect them, embrace them. So what is the first step in your opinion to take, you know, to take steps down that path toward greater ocean protection and conservation? It's, it, it is all about knowing and, and not, not just mouthing the words and not just saying, yes, we have a problem. It's embracing the problem with whatever superpower you have. And nobody has the same capacity to do something as the next person. It, it takes everybody doing their thing in their way. Some people like you, you have a way with words. You have a communication capacity. You're using that power, bravo. Others have a way to crunch numbers, to it dive into the past and anticipate the future and model the possibilities. Again, bravo, use that power. Others have the power to invest with their resources to favor protection of wild spaces on the land and in the sea. Everybody can do something. If you have a backyard or front yard, a little piece of land, consider what you can plant there that will be favorable to nature, to the birds, to the insects. Um, I, I challenge people to ask them, how much lawn do you really need? Uh, can you really transform that space into something that will be an enduring carbon capture, species diversity friendly? You know, plant native trees, native flowers, and you know, a vegetable garden is always a good way to help give back. And the power that individuals have to communicate what they know. If you your kids can really get to the minds and hearts of adults. And I have such, I don't know, excitement 
and confidence in in the kids coming along because even at the age of 10, they are aware of so much that no one could know when I was a child. They're aware of what Earth looks like from space. Nobody had been to space when I was 10. Nobody. Uh, the, the idea that nations come, can come together for common purpose. I was 10 years old when, when the United Nations had just come into being and nations were really beginning to talk to one another and you know, they're all different and glory be, the differences are to be treasured and, and polished and, and cared for. But the fact that we as humans have common ground and have to work together to protect our common life support system, well, that's become something that we understand. International agreements across the board that we, we generally have stopped killing whales. International agreements to stop certain forms of pollution for the ocean. That I think is cause for hope. I started an organization 10 years ago, <laughs> talking about decades, but that um, is aimed at protecting the ocean by inspiring local champions and communities to identify places that they know and love and are willing to commit to doing something to make them better than they currently are. Hope Spots is a network of hope to create places that will help restore health to the ocean and working with other partners. National Geographic has a program of pristine seas to identify areas that are still in pretty good shape. And as with Mission Blue, to work with communities and governments to have official policies like the national parks. People can embrace their backyard and protect it, but imagine if you can get a country to establish you know, thousands of acres or thousands of square miles of land and sea. And nations are coming together with a goal of protecting 30% of the land and the sea by 10 years, by 2030. I mean, what a concept. There is reason for hope. Individuals can be part, not only can be part of the action, you are a part of the action, either by doing something or by doing nothing. You're part of the problem by doing nothing because that means you're supporting the trend that we're all experiencing right now, a time of decline. But you can be the hero for your kids and all the kids in the future who can't vote. <laughs> you can vote, do something about it. <laughs> really, it's within your power to bring a different trend, a different world, a place where civilization can prosper instead of a civilization anticipating inevitable decline because we can't breathe or the water is polluted or who knows what has been caused by, by nanoplastics or other forms of dire um, <laughs> consequences of, of our behavior. Maybe started in ignorance, but now we know we know we have the power to change. So what are we waiting for? Well, and it makes me think, I, I think one of the scariest things about what the damage we're doing to the oceans is, and I, and I might have this wrong, but I think it's something like 10, we've only explored about 10% of the ocean. There's so much that we don't understand about the ocean. And there's so much that we do understand about the damage that we're doing. When you think about how vast the ocean is, how much is left to be explored. What fears do you have about the unknown damage that we may not even understand we're doing? Oh, several things. One of them is noise. Not a problem, we thought back in the 50s, 60s. It's only when we began to see whales really impacted by loud noises generated by seismic testing or other ways that we put noise into the sea by the ship traffic 
whales in Alaska avoiding areas where cruise ships were going, not because they were being killed directly, but the noise. We didn't even know that marine mammals made sounds early in the 20th century. We, maybe some people knew and suspected it because, <laughs> you know, sea lions and seals make sounds, but whales, that's largely a 20th century discovery that has in, become widely known and in and, and the fact that not only do whales but all marine mammals communicate with sound all birds communicate with sound now we know it may be so that crustaceans lobsters even tiny little crustaceans communicate with sound probably all fish do May, they may make sounds that are inaudible to us, but so do elephants. It's only when we began to record using instrumentation to pick up the low frequency sounds that we can't hear that we began to appreciate, both with whales, with bats, with many kinds of creatures that have superpowers <laughs> of transmitting sound and receiving sound. We're now realizing how much we're interfering with their communication, which is vital for their existence. Deep sea mining looms on the horizon. Perversely, it's being touted as something that we need to do for green energy. Wrong. We don't need to mine the deep sea for the metals that are needed now, at least for now in batteries that power our computers and our cell phones and other products that we've come to rely upon for current civilization. But there are other sources on the land. Mining is a really uh, disruptive business in terms of what it does when you dig big holes in the land, you displace a lot of creatures. But when we didn't know the consequences Mining technologies were brutal. They still are. But now that we know the consequences and we can put on the balance sheet the need to take into account the impact on the environment, we can do a lot better, like using rivers as a place to dump mine tailings. I mean, even the, the 49ers, where I am here in California, 1849, about the time that gold was discovered, created huge pollution problems in the 1800s by dumping the mine tailings. They used mercury to process gold, to extract it from the, the, the ore that contains the, 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 uh, the gold. And so pouring mercury into rivers and into groundwater, it's lethal, it's toxic killed a lot of things and it's still killing a lot of things. The pollution from centuries ago is still a problem for the 21st century and beyond. So there's no excuse now though. And now that we know, we can, we can clean up our act with mining on the land. There are human factors as well with child labor engaged in mining. There's, that's a choice. That's not a necessity. We can fix that. What we cannot fix is taking bulldozer-like machinery to the bottom of the ocean, tearing up the seafloor, tearing up places that have never been touched by human actions before, except by the chemistry of the ocean, which is pervasive, the acidification of the ocean by dumping things in the sea. There's trash even in the deepest parts of the ocean. Discoveries recently of, of trash, plastic in the Mariana Trench, seven miles down, 11 kilometers. I mean, it's, it's a wake up call. We are impacting even these distant places that we've not previously accessed deliberately by our uh, unintentional dumping, our unintentional transformation of the ocean's chemistry. So why would we intentionally go about tearing up the seafloor when we 
know enough to know that the diversity is at an extremely high level. It includes categories of life found nowhere on the land and nowhere in shallow forms, at foot, the sunlit places. These are creatures that are dedicated deep sea organisms that rely on chemosynthesis, not photosynthesis, to generate food and, and, and power entire communities with forms of life that genetically share much that we have in common, but they have unique characteristics that we, we don't want to lose by destroying and just simply going in and taking what we want and, and really demolishing the rest. And, and when you listen to some of the arguments for why we need to do this, First of all, it's a choice, it's not a need. And it's a maybe a short-term choice because crafty engineers are working to find alternative materials for batteries, carbon-based materials that are common, um, using <laughs> lead acid batteries. That's what we use in most cars these days, but they can be greatly improved to be more efficient than they currently are but we've been investing instead in lithium and cobalt and nickel as an advance in better storage we've sort of put aside what was serving us well but maybe could serve us better if we really focus on improving them and who knows in 10 years time what alternative avenues for battery creation and especially long-term storage that we're working flat out right now. So we're not so reliant on lithium, cobalt, and nickel, and other so-called rare earth metals that are incorporated into our, our computers and other machinery. To go green, the miners claim we must go deep. No. <laughs> By going deep, you are doing exactly what humans have done throughout our history. We see something that we can market and we create a business around it, not really taking into account the greater value, not only potentially for you, the investor, but for the investment of civilization. I <laughs> can't help but relate to the film that James Cameron released some years ago, Avatar. If you saw the film, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, then please go look at it and see the civilization that respected life. They had trees that they really relied on for their life force. Those trees were growing on uh, in soil that contained minerals that obviously had to be an earth corporation that went to this other planet <laughs> where there had been harmony with nature. And they had to go and because they had discovered that the, this mineral that was so important to the living trees, but also important to power this other civilization that came in. The mineral is called unobtainium. Unobtainium. That's what these minerals in the bottom of the sea should be called, unobtainium. To get them, you're going to destroy life and, and in the process have an impact on all of the planet. I cannot tell you with a straight face that I know exactly what the consequences would be, but I do know that it would be catastrophic for the systems that we're just beginning to explore, learn about the superpowers of the sea cucumbers that populate the deep sea. These remarkable creatures that generate food using chemosynthesis, the whole kingdom of life known as the archaea, that do prosper in the digestive systems of cows, some variations, 
in our digestive system as well, living in the dark and not utilizing photosynthesis to convert materials into carbon-based substances. But the ocean, the deep sea in the dark is notorious as the place where they were first discovered and, and are powering along with bacteria, archaea and bacteria together in the dark are providing this enormous carbon sink that we can disrupt if we choose to, or we can respect it, put a moratorium on its destruction at the very least, the way we did on the killing of whales with benefits to the whales, benefits to the deep sea, benefits perhaps with a moratorium of at least 10 years maybe a permanent moratorium because natural areas that have that represent the distillation of all preceding history four and a half billion years of fine tuning that we would willingly sacrifice for short-term marketing gain that may be a market that no longer exists in 10 years i mean what are we thinking why would we consider doing something so outrageous, so potentially damaging to everything we care about. Yeah, I don't know if it's if it's a lack of knowledge, if it's a lack of empathy, but clearly, you know, from this conversation, there's so much to learn, so much more to learn. And, and luckily for us, you have this unbelievable wealth of knowledge, and you 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 are so willing, and you continue to share that knowledge. With the world, you have a new book coming out called National Geographic Ocean, A Global Odyssey. What can we look forward to with this book? Well, I should say thanks to COVID-19. <laughs> because of COVID-19, I wasn't traveling. I'm still not traveling much. But I really had a chance to dive into what we now know about climate, about the origin of the ocean, about the importance of the diversity of life, about what we don't know. I think I've come to conclude that the greatest discovery, maybe in all of history, but certainly of the 20th century, maybe now into the 21st, is the magnitude of what we don't know and how we must, we just must embrace the precautionary principle going forward. Look at old growth forests, undisturbed deserts are not wastelands, they're miracles, where animals and plants have come to grips with dealing with, with small amounts of water. We can learn from them. How do they do it? How do they manage to live and prosper in arid climates? We shouldn't be just full speed ahead Let's tear up, let's irrigate the deserts. Let's make them prosperous. Well, they are prosperous as they are intact. It doesn't mean that some of what we have done to convert dry lands into fields and farms has been bad, but we ought to stop right now where there are, where there's still intact old growth deserts and respect them and look at them with wonder and awe. Look at the deep sea. We don't know exactly what we'll find in terms of new products that we can really use to our advantage from by, by treating the ocean as a library, not a mine, to think about not just materials or potentially new chemicals, new pharmaceuticals that exist in this wondrous, diverse huh, library, if you will, of life. But looking at how creatures interact, what collaborations are going on that, that we can learn from, that we can apply to agriculture. We, we're learning how important 
that network of life in forests that we can't see, the underground roots, and the role of bacteria, the role of nematodes, little tiny, sometimes pests, but sometimes critical factors in, in transforming chemicals that are useful to the trees and other, uh, the, the fungi. I call them mycorrhizae that invade the roots of plants, but they're, it's, a, it's a happy invasion. They are vital to the health of the roots and transforming chemicals into a form that the trees can then use. It's a nutrient cycle that involves third parties or fourth parties or 10 parties. It's a community. And, and we, we've been really slow to grab onto that understanding. Well, we do know that we are populated now with a, now we know with microbiomes that make digestion possible without them, we couldn't survive. It's collaboration. We're all ecosystems. Nobody thought about that when I was a child, but now kids grow up with the idea that we're microbiome. We have a microbiome. We have bacteria, glory be, that keep us healthy. We have to respect them, keep them happy. Probiotics, big economic deal for those who are in the business of marketing probiotics. Now we know. So what don't we know? That's what's exciting. I mean, the kids of today are so lucky to come along knowing that this is the greatest era of exploration and discovery ever. And it could happen in your backyard. It could happen in that little space between the cracks in the cement in a city. There are miracles happening there. You could be the one to discern the superpower of the moss that's living there. How do they do it? <laughs> and who lives with them? And, you know, I just hope we don't lose the chance. We're right on the edge of this greatest era of discovery ever. And we could be blinded by short-term gain, selling metals that derived by destroying the deep sea, clear-cutting forests because we want to plant we want to plant whatever we want to plant when old growth forests are priceless. Old growth redwood trees have secrets about how have they existed for hundreds or even thousands of years. What can their roots tell us? Or we could sell it for lawn furniture and turn the land into a place to have cows. I mean, we're doing a lot of that. even. Now, deforesting the land and extracting wildlife out of the ocean on a scale that is staggering. I mean, we don't think of fish as wildlife. We have policies about limiting and wildlife trade. And we're now understanding the connections between healthy ecosystems and healthy people and protecting wildlands and restoring marshes and planting trees. And, but the ocean, we still think of, let's kill the wildlife, we call it seafood, and let's turn it, them into products. Most people who are actually taking wildlife, the industrial scale fishing, don't consume the wildlife, they're selling the wildlife. It's all about money. It's mostly about money. Those who extract are sometimes the consumers. And coastal communities, especially island communities, truly do rely on ocean life for sustenance. But the great majority of what is taken from the ocean is, is a choice, a choice to take those wild animals and sell them for money to buy things. It's like killing an elephant for the ivory. You don't eat the elephant, you just sell the part of the elephant that will bring you money. Or you can sell the whole elephant. You can sell the whole dolphin for money. You're not eating the dolphin, you're just selling the, the, <laughs> the carcass or the live animal. Um, people need to just take the shades away from their eyes and look at the ocean 
as our life support system filled not with seafood but with sea life and yes people will eat fish and they'll eat lobsters and they'll eat shrimp and clams and lobsters and oysters and anything else something that moves will probably find a way to eat it or turn it into a product but consider the cost the real cost and consider just choosing something else to 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 support your sustenance. I mean, we have lots of people making that recommendation for the land, eat low on the food chain, plants are delicious, turn the chefs, mighty chefs loose, loose on making plant-based diets really exciting and delicious. They are, they can be. Um, or if, if you don't want to you know, just, just cut back or know what kind of, of animal you're eating know where it has come from. What has it been eating? A lot of talk about quotes, safely grown cows and pigs and chickens, quotes organic. What about ocean wildlife? I mean, they're wild, but that's no guarantee. What have they been eating? How many nanoplastics and microplastics have they been consuming? What role have you had in breaking the link, the nutrient cycle that is critically involving carbon, your role in part of the climate problem that we now face by taking the carbon, the blue carbon out of the ocean. If you just think about how old a creature is that might be on your plate. Chickens, probably less than a year. Cows, probably less than two years. And it's true with other animals, mammals that we consume but even a little herring on your plate is likely to be at least three years old, can be 10. A grouper takes, you know, five or six years before it matures to make more grouper. A bluefin tuna, about 10 years before it can start reproducing, maybe 30 years old by the time it becomes a big prized target for the, the sushi market. These orange roughy might be older than your grandparents. Chilean sea bass, likewise. Deep sea fish tend to be older, but even a grouper, a cod can be 30 years old. Well, there aren't many of them left now because we take the big ones first, part of the problem. So knowing what you're eat, eating <laughs> and asking yourself, do I want this creature to become a part of me? Where has it come from? How old is it? What's it been eating? These are logical questions. And for your health, as well as the health of the planet, they're questions you should be ready to answer. Well, Dr. Earl, it's such an honor. Thank you so much. You've been so generous for your time. You mentioned Mission Blue, which is the organization that you found. We will link to that in our show notes. So people can learn more about it and how they can support it. Dr. Earl, thank you again so much for joining the Climate Pod. Yes, thank you. And I think link into the National Geographic's website, the many things that they're doing in a positive way to go from decline to recovery. Yeah. And I'm proud to still be there as an explorer <laughs> while working with Mission Blue and many other organizations to turn from where we are to get to a better place. And thank you make- for ha- having me on board. We will make sure to listen to link to the National Geographic as well. Again, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Earl. Thank you for joining the Climate Pod. Thank you.